Amri of the Maimer, Vihine Anachnum Almim Alumim from Ter Er Pashas Vayeshev, Chafzain on the second side. The Pasuk says that in Yosef's stream, the brothers were bundling up a grain. And then they, then they uh, had all their bundles around and bowed to Yosef's bundle in the middle. So to understand the spiritual meaning of this dream, we first have to explain a whole other concept. In the end of Parshas Vayishlach, it talks about the, the uh, kings of Esav. And Esav's descendants, who became the kingdom of Edom, had seven kings. They all lived and then died. And only afterwards was uh, the Jewish king starting with Shaul. Now, what's the concept spiritually? that the kings of Esau represent this great spiritual level, but it was untamed. It wasn't put into a system, and therefore every specific spiritual energy felt that it was only one, and each one also was too powerful for its container, and therefore the energies, the spiritual lights, all cracked and came down into the uh, more mundane world, the, world, the lower worlds of Bria, Yatir, and Asiya, creation, formation, and action, uh, did not remain in the highest world of Atsilos of emanation. And when this happened, they were no longer easily identifiable as godly, and uh, they became entrenched within the mundane world. Now, this happened to uh, souls, it happened to angels, and it happened to spiritual energy, energies. All of them became stuck in low worlds where their godly source was not very evident. An example of this idea is when you have uh, a word and every word has a meaning. When you, when you divide up the word and put each letter somewhere else, then each letter by itself has no meaning. In a similar way, although all of these are holy, godly energies, that's only when they all surround Hashem. But when they separate into each with its own focus, then they're no longer uh, obviously godly. That's not, uh, it's not something discernible anymore. And... Ha this actually explains how we have multiplicity altogether. Hashem is one. The whole concept of division and multiplicity comes from Shira Sakhalim, where these godly energies, because everything was godly, because they were too powerful for their vessels, they came down in such a way where uh, it was, their godly source is no longer discernible. And when something is not godly, then multiplicity is possible. Now, the highest spiritual world is called Atsilos, emanation. And so when the Torah talks about the beginning of creation and we have uh, Aden, which is the highest point in Atsilos, uh, of course, we have a physical place, Gan Aden, but it also represent, it represents that spiritual high, high point of Atsilos. Out of Aden, there's a river, and the river goes to, uh, to feed, to give water to Gan, to the Garden of Eden. And then after that, the river divides into four parts. That's because the garden, the, the garden is at the bottom of the world of Atsilos. And then after that, there's it, the godly energy moves into the worlds of Bria, Yitzhia, Asiya, Bia, where there is division and multiplicity and therefore four rivers. And although it starts off with only minor multiplicity in Bria, only four, but then it moves on to more multiplicity, the we have four rivers. We also have four camps. The Jewish people divided into in the desert, Yehuda, Ruben, uh, Don, and Ephraim. And then eventually they move into 600,000 families. And then nowadays there's far more unit. And uh, this also uh, relates to the uh, sparks of godliness that uh, Kabbalah says there were 288 sparks of godliness that uh, came down from the Shira Sakhalin, from the breaking of vessels. And this is hinted in the word right in the second verse of the Torah, Merachefes, which is made up of two words. The first and last letter, Mem and Sof, is Meis, dead. And then the middle letters, uh, Rachaf is Rapach, the 288 sparks. And each of those sparks divide into many sub sparks. And therefore, we have to refine each of those sub sparks bit by bit. By bit. And this explains why the exile, why, why Golos takes so long. If all our, we have to do is refine 288 sparks, we should be done already. But the explanation is each of those sparks divide into many parts. Now, 
Yes, there is multiplicity, which is not good. It disguises the godly oneness, but we can fix it. Hashem is one. His name is one. And we, the Jewish people, are the people of oneness that our job is to bring everything together. So everything should again be obviously godly. It's all made of godliness and all for a godly purpose. Now, the tribes were doing this when they bundled together wheat. That's the idea of bringing together these disparate parts and revealing their inner, inner core, which is all godliness. Another meaning of malmim alumim, besides bundling wheat, is the idea of mute. Because in order to lift something up to its godly source, we have to be spiritually mute, meaning with humility and self-nullification. We find this concept with the fetus, which receives everything from the mother and is in and is mute both practically and also spiritually uh, this also happens we have a second time being a spiritual fetus when we want to learn from a teacher and we're so intense on listening to them it's a great wisdom we're not thinking about what we think about their idea we're just tr totally focusing on taking in their idea <laughs> This was also represented in the base of Migdash in the temple where there were these 12 bulls and then a pool on top. The 12 bulls represent the multiplicity of Bria, the world of Bria, where there's already creation, there's already an other, whereas the pool on top represents Malchus of Attilus, where there's still the world of oneness. Now, although the tribes did their best to bring up all physical and reveal its godly uh, inner core and uh, bring it, make it one with Hashem, but they could only do it to the extent of human capacity. Whereas when Hashem uh, comes to the party, so to speak, Hashem gifts us with full oneness, that's, that's actually far greater. That refinement from Hashem is far greater than anything we could accomplish. Even when we daven, with the energy we get from eating physical food and therefore elevate that food, it's only to the extent we can. But to make it truly one, it's from a gift from Hashem. Even Rabbi Akiva, who gave up his life for Hashem, and he did it happily, but still that's just the ultimate, the greatest of human capacity. It was Hashem's gift to Rabbi Akiva to make that into an act of true oneness. Now, Yosef is coming from a different perspective. The tribes are from the world and they're lifting it up to Hashem. Yosef is with, his soul is from within Atzillus. And his job is besides supporting the brothers in lifting the physical to Hashem, also helping to elicit that godly perspective and that gift of Hashem towards us. And that's why the brothers bow to Yosef because Yes, he joined in with them on the basic task of lifting the physical, but he was also able to bring, to elicit that godly to them, which created, allowed for the greater level of oneness that could only come from on top. Now, Yaakov also was a soul of Attilus. Why did he bow to Yosef? He didn't he, wa he wasn't coming from the lower perspective. The reason is because bowing has two functions. One is when you're coming from below and having humility and self-nullification before the godly energy, which is beyond. But bowing is also about bringing down that energy. You take it from the head and put it down. And that's what Yaakov wanted to achieve through his bowing. And that's why in the second dream, not only the brothers bow to Yosef, but also Yaakov, represented by the son, bows to Yosef. Now, the brothers hated Yosef because they felt that although their souls were souls of Bria, but they, they can, through their avoda, they can reach Atsilas, through their uh, service of Hashem, they can reach Atsilas, the highest world themselves. But the truth is they needed an actual soul of Atsilas. They needed Yosef, and therefore they were mistaken. This concludes the moment.